right, we are studying 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in 1 Corinthians, we're really getting at Christian liberty, right? The Corinthians had inquired uh, about their Christian liberty, and they took it to meat. Can we eat of meat that has been offered up to idols? And Paul writes and says, technically you can't. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to ask yourself some questions. And whether it's about eating meat or, you know, and you can take this into all kinds of other things. Way back when, when, you know, when I was a teenager, it was uh, going to the movies. I never went to the movies when I was little because good Christians didn't. <laughs> Don't know why they didn't, but good Christians didn't. And so we didn't. And uh, then uh, after I made it out of the house, then I started going. And... Now that's not even an issue anymore, right? But uh, you can take it from movies, you can bring it into alcohol, you can take it into um, you know, any other subject that the Bible does not strictly say. You know, if the Bible says thou shalt not, then it's not a question, right? Mm -hmm. you, don't have Christ, you don't have Christian liberty to do something when the Bible says thou shalt not. But when it comes to other things... You might be free to do it. There's nothing holding you back from it. So, but we must ask ourselves some questions. And we've gone through that, haven't we? How will it affect others? And when we talk about others, we're talking about the unbeliever and the new believer. I'm not talking about someone that claims to be a mature Christian. I'm not talking about someone that's a Pharisee. I'm not talking about someone that is steeped in their own religions and... Uh, you know, demand things of you. I'm talking about the unbeliever. I'm talking about the new believer. How will it affect them? And how will it affect my ability to witness to them? Secondly then, how is it going to affect me? If I take myself to the edge, I say in my Christian liberty I can do this thing, but that leads me into sin, then that disqualifies me from being a good witness for God, doesn't it? That disqualifies me uh, to really be your pastor, right? If I'm involved with some kind of uh, habitual sin, it should disqualify from me from being your pastor. And there's many pastors, though, that have found wiggled their ways back into the pulpit, and there's all kinds of televangelists and people on the TV that have spent their time in jail and done all kinds of horrible things, and they end up back on the TV swindling people back out of their money. But... We need to be careful about our own Christian liberties, don't we? How close do we really want to get to sin? And will we get to the point that disqualifies us? So as we've been going down here through then, verse 13, we ended up with last week where it says, There hath no temptation, no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So, there might be temptations, and that's really where we spent our time with last week, right? There's temptations, and temptations are good. They're fine. God uses those to prove us. God uses those to help us grow closer to Him. A temptation is not bad. Temptation is not a sin. If a temptation was a sin, then Christ sinned because he was tempted of Satan. That's simply a, 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 an outward trial of your flesh that God allows to come into your life. And the nice thing is, according to that verse then, he gives the way of escape. He gives you the way out. It turns into a sin when that temptation comes and let's say, you know, it's some kind of disease in your family or something bad happens to someone in your family, and you can use that to prove yourself to grow closer to God, or you can use that and shake your fist at God and say, how dare you, God? Who do you think you are? Then it turns into a sin, right? As you lash out at God. So we have the way out. Verse 14 then says, wherefore, it's a very intense particle here. It intensifies the logical connection that he's about to make. So by going right out to the edge of allowable sin, because, or of, of allowable things, because that's really where we've been taking ourselves, right? We see something that's out there. We 
use all of our Christian liberty and take ourselves right to that very edge where we aren't necessarily sinning, but we are flirting with that disaster. We're getting close to that. And he says, where for then? Let him, oh, got to go down to verse 14. There was, a, there was a wherefore in verse 12. Wherefore, my dearly beloved. When he says my dearly beloved, we get wherefore my beloved many times in scripture, don't we? Whenever we see beloved, it, it, it just means I love you, I care for you, you're my Christian brother, I'm going to treat you like family. But here, he actually uses a, uses a very uncommon phrase in the Greek, and that's why now you get my dearly beloved. He takes it even a step further, and it expresses a deep, deep, deep sentiment in his heart. I am imploring you. I want you to you know I'm not saying these things because I don't like you. I'm saying these things because I love you, and I love you probably beyond anything you can even imagine. And sometimes if you can imagine your own family, you know, and, and you've gone through certain hard things and hard times, and you're imploring someone. Is he coming out of the wall? He's getting pretty excited over there, isn't he? Now he's back over there now. What's that? Did you see him? No? He was over there. Now he's over there. But he's in the wall. I think there's more than one. There's more than one? There's some kind of squirrel or something running in the walls. Oh, no, you don't have to. He's, he's in the walls. You know what? They've been in the walls so much, and I put out poison and all kinds of things, and I can't seem to get them. I don't know how he's getting in or where he's getting in or how he's going around in there, but he runs through the, I mean, he gets from there to there fast, too, so I don't know what he's doing in there. What's that? Online. Oh, yeah, oh, it's all online, yeah, it's fine. You can, if you want to hear the squirrels, come on in to Faith Bible Church and sit down here. You can listen to them yourself, too. We'll gladly welcome you in. We won't have any Ray Stevens, though. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know Ray Stevens the day the squirrel went berserk. That is correct. <laughs> What were we saying before Satan interrupted us with a squirrel? <laughs> he says, my dearly beloved, and where I was taking that to is you, you know what it's like. You've gone through a hard time in your life. You've gone through some struggles. You don't want your children to go through it. You don't want your family members to go through it. And you just say, please, just listen to me. I want you to listen to me. I, I've been through it. I, I know what you're going to go through, and you're going to do this thing, and it's going to be the biggest mistake in your life. Please don't do it. I'm imploring you. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Listen, I've seen this happen over and over and over and over again. People are using their Christian liberties. They're taking it to the nth degree. They're taking it right up to the line of where it's going to step into sin. They can't handle it. And then, then they just fly right into the sin and they can't ever return from it. Don't do this to yourselves. My dearly beloved, don't do it. We're going to talk about that next phrase, flee from idolatry. This is what it's really all about, right? And, and what he's saying is, instead of taking yourself right to the edge, flee it. Run as far away from it as you possibly can get. Why are you flirting with it? You know, they have volcanoes and different things around the world. And we watched a, I watched a documentary about these, these people. They would go over to Australia and then go visit this volcano. And they walk right up to the edge of the volcano and look into it and see it. And it was great, but guess what? One day they were there, it went off. I forget how many hundreds of people died. And it didn't even spew out lava. It's just spewed out noxious gas and, and burning hot steaming gas. And, and uh, this one guy laid over the top of his wife and, and it just destroyed him basically. But she lived because of it because it only got to him. Why go up there and look into a volcano if you know it's alive and active? doesn't make any sense, right? Get as far away from that thing as you can. By the way, nowadays you can't even go visit it. They've closed the whole thing off because of that tragedy that happened. 
get so far away from it you can't even see it. That's really what he's getting at here. But then he uses this phrase, I speak as to wise men. So he brings in this idea, and, and the, the, the word wise, by the way, is intelligent. That's really what it means. It, it, it's not an obscure argument. And what he's really saying is, you don't have to be a genius to figure this thing out. I'm speaking to you. You can figure it out. I'm going to tell you something that's going to be so obvious, I shouldn't even have to say the words. And you know what? There's so many times at work that I have to tell people, and I'm scratching my head saying, why am I having to say this? You should be smart enough not to have to do that, right? So many times I have to have those conversations. It doesn't even make sense. I saw a video on, from Friday, I think it was. School bus going through a neighborhood. And, and the, the speed limit in the neighborhood is 25. The school bus, according to the reports, was going at least 45. And there's a stop sign in the neighborhood, and it never stops at the stop sign. Because no cars are ever coming the other direction. Guess what happened on Friday? It's in Ohio, I think it was. You can look it up and watch it. A city bus was coming the opposite direction. Ran into that school bus, flipped it all the way up on its side. Why would I have to have a conversation with anybody about stopping at a stop sign? We stop at stop signs, right? They're there for a reason. It only makes sense to do it. If I found out one of my bus drivers was doing that, I would throw a fit. They might lose their job over something like that. You shouldn't have to have those conversations. And Paul is saying the exact same type of thing here. Listen, it should be common sense that if there's something that's going to hurt you and there's something that's a sin, why in the world would you play with it? Why would you get so close to it that you can get it on you? Why would you be so close that you can even see it? Common sense says get as far away from that thing as you possibly can. Don't be standing right next to it. Don't stand right next to a volcano when it erupts. It doesn't make any sense. Get as far away from it as you can. That's common sense. So he says, use your brain. I speak to you as to wise men, and that simply means think it through. This isn't rocket science. Then he says, in verse 14, he says, flee from idolatry. And that's really what this is all hinging on. Now, idolatry, it, it, it's a category of words. Uh, or, or we could put it in a category. Just like words like blasphemy and damned and hell and Judas. They all have this negative context, don't, don't they? Idolatry has a negative context. Because it is negative. It's the most serious and contaminating sin that there is listed in the Bible. It is serious and it contaminates everything. Why? Because it strikes directly at the character of God. When you worship anything other than God, then it's idolatry. And once you have change the character of God in your own mind, you've lost all of the guidelines for morality and moral judgment. Why is it that this world, and we scratch our head at this world and say, how in the world can they pass laws like that? How in the world can people do this thing and just, you know, get away with it all the time? Criminals, you know, all over the streets. We got that guy in uh, Philadelphia right now. He's what, a 120 pound, five foot guy that scaled the walls of the prison and has escaped and running around in Philadelphia in some botanical gardens. You know, how does he even get out? And to top it off, he's an illegal immigrant. He's from Brazil. He's wanted for murder in Brazil. He murdered his girlfriend in front of all of their, their kids, and now he's out running around again. And you scratch your head and say, how do these things even happen? Morality goes right out the door when we change who God is. Because the only morality that we really have is the truths that are written here in Scripture. 
And somehow, some way, you got this guy that thinks it's okay to murder people because he's completely changed who God is in his life. And the rest of the world does the exact same thing. That's why in the Ten Commandments, the first three have to do with idolatry. The Bible has much to say about idolatry, doesn't it? We could take time and go through every passage of Scripture in the Bible that talks about idolatry, but you would be here a really long time. <laughs> you would want me to stop. You would probably take a nap. <laughs> I might take a nap to get through it all. Idolatry is slander to the character of God. Tozer says this about idolatry. A God begotten in the shadows of a fallen heart will quite naturally be no true likeness of the true God. The shadows of a fallen heart is what leads to idolatry. And it's a terrible sin. Romans 1.21 says, When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their wild imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into images made like unto corruptible men. That's what man has done. That's idolatry. They change God. They attack his character. They turn him into something else in their head. And they promote something else than the true God. So I'm going to tell you, idolatry is any time you fail. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of different things, okay? I'm going to go through a list of a few things of what idolatry is. What is idolatry? Of course, it's attacking the character of God. But it's also anything or any time that you fail to trust God. That's going to be idolatry. In John... He says, he that believes not makes God a liar. Christians and people in the world, they have trials, they have struggles that come in, and instead of a praying and trusting God, they panic, and that is idolatry. Why is that idolatry? Because you are saying, God, you can't handle it. You've given this in my life, or something's happened in my life, and how can you do that? You can't handle it. I'm going to have to lean on to something else. I'll turn to modern psychology. I'll do whatever. And it's idolatry because you've made God less than he is. And anytime you make God less than he is, it's idolatry. Idolatry is also worshiping the true God in the wrong way. Remember in our, in our morning lesson that we had this morning in, first, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 5, it says there that they had a form of godliness. That's worshiping God in the wrong way. You can go to church and you can go to some Christian churches that promote the true God, kind of, but then they get it all wrong and you end up going to worship at a so-called Christian church that claims that they believe in the one and only true God, but you do it all in the wrong way, and that's idol worship. In Exodus chapter 32, you have the Israelites, and they make a golden calf. Guess what? They said, they claimed that they were worshiping the true God. They still said, you know, this is of uh, the, the real true God that they that the Israelites had. It wasn't. It was the wrong way. It's not what God wanted. But they were pretending that it was. It was made to be a representation of the true God that brought them out of Egypt. They were worshiping the true God in the wrong way. And you can't do that. Some people say, well, my God is different than what you're promoting that the Bible says. Well, if the Bible says it, it's true, and you can't change it, and if you do change it, then you're worshiping someone other than God. And that's idol worship. Much of that's going on today, isn't it? People are going bananas. They have no orientation towards the truth. They stand up, they sit down, they light candles, they go hocus pocus. They have mindless worship, and it doesn't make any sense. When you... Do not worship God 
out of truth, because you have no truth, then you only tend to worship God out of your senses. And it turns into a sensual worship, and that's idol worship. Third thing I'll tell you about idol worship, or what idolatry is, is it's worshiping an image that is not God. And when we think of idolatry, this is what we tend to lean towards, right? Sometimes we forget about the other things with idol worship. But idolatry is also worshiping other idols. That's very obvious when you go to foreign countries. You'll see idol worship all over the place. You can't imagine. Once in a while here in America, you'll see it. You'll drive by someone's house and they'll have their place of worship out in their yard. And it's usually Mother Mary. Or, you know, it's usually got some little thing there that they worship too because they pray to Mother Mary. Well, that's the worship of some other image, isn't it? In the Bible, you have idol worship and, you know, what, what they, they put up those idols in the temple one time and God made them fall down on their faces because <laughs> God takes it seriously and he hates idol worship. In Isaiah in chapter 44, he is talking about idol worship. He's talking about the stupidity of it. And in verse number 10, they, they made a form of a God. In Isaiah 44 and verse 15, it says that they made uh, carved images. They fell down to it. They burned parts of it in the fire. They, they, they made an offering. They ate part of the flesh. They made a roast and satisfied themselves. They warmed themselves with it. And in verse 17 it says, And the residue of it he makes a god, even his carved image. He falls down into it and worships it and prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. And that's exactly what some cultures and places and people still do today. They fall down to an idol and they worship it. And I'll tell you today in America, we might not set them up, but we have idol worship. Anything that takes precedence over God, that's more important to God, that you're going to do instead of uh, communing with God, it's going to be an idol worship. And it can be anything from, and I always bring up fishing because I love to fish. If I fish instead of doing something I'm supposed to be doing for God, that's an idol worship. If I'm watching my TV all day, every day, and you know, there's nothing wrong with the TV, but if I do that instead of go to worship or going out and doing something I'm supposed to be doing for God, it's an idol worship. Another thing I'm going to tell you that idol worship is, and we find people doing it, is the worship of angels. Don't ever do that. And I'll tell you that much of the idol worship and much of the idolatry that goes on throughout the world is nothing more than worshiping demons, and those are angels. They're just fallen angels. John, in Revelation, he tried to worship an angel, didn't he? Remember what the angel said? Don't do that. Don't worship me. Worship God. Colossians 2.18. Watch out for this false doctrine about worshiping angels. Angels are tremendous beings. They're amazing beings. But we're not to worship them. Ephesians 5.5. 5. For this you know, that no fornicator, nor unclean person, nor covetous man has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. If you are worshiping anything other than God, you do not have a place in heaven. I'll also tell you that coveting stuff is idol worship. You're telling God he has not given you enough. You need more. I deserve more. God isn't into just giving you stuff. That's not what worshiping God is about. So what are we to do about idol worship? Well, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14. Flee from idolatry. Plain and simple, right? We talk a lot about idolatry tonight. What do we do? Flee. If you can see it, flee it. Don't wait till you get close. Don't wait till you get a little dirty. Don't wait until it makes you sin a little bit. That's what some people want to do. Try to figure out how close they can get without sinning. Flee it. Why? 
because it will destroy you. And it will destroy your family, and it will destroy everything else. Isaiah 65, 5, God says that the people that were involved with idolatry are smoke in my nose. Have you ever had smoke in your nose? That's great, isn't it? You light, you light a fire out there, you're getting ready to do your s'mores, and the wind changes direction and blows in your face. You love that, right? doesn't bother your nose at all to have that happen. doesn't bother your eyes at all. Of course it does. And when God says there is smoke in my eyes, you know what there, or a smoke in my nose, he's saying they irritate me. It's an irritant. God doesn't like it. He hates it. Jeremiah 50 and verse 38 says, Idols have driven you mad. You know what will happen if you are too involved with idol worship and you get... And the crazy thing is, you can go to church every Sunday and still be involved with idol worship. And you take yourself to where you think, I'm really close, but I'm not sinning, I'm good, I'm okay. And you won't even know it, but you are into idol worship beyond your wildest imagination. Why? Because it drives you mad, you lose your senses, you don't know what's going on anymore. And you've convinced yourself that it's okay. And it's not. Joshua 23, 7, that you come not among these nations, these that remain among you, don't intermingle, don't make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves to them, but cling to the Lord your God. Joshua says, don't invite those idol worshipers into the nation. You know, one of the greatest problems Israel had God was telling them to go out and slaughter all these different countries, wasn't he? Get rid of them all. Kill every man, woman, and child. Get rid of them. Don't take them in. And people say, what a horrible God is that? And some people, I had a lady, we were, the whole church, this was at my other church, we were all going to read through the Bible in a year. And we started on it, and we started getting to where all these fights were going on. She said, I just can't take it anymore. <laughs> there's too much killing. There's too much bloodshed. I don't understand it. How can God do that? He... I understand maybe getting in war and fighting and the men dying, but the children? Really, we're going to kill the children? How horrible! Can you imagine if we did that today? <coughs> Go into Afghanistan and start killing everybody <coughs> off and kill the women and children too? Imagine what everybody would think. Why did God have the Israelites kill every man, woman, and children of the countries next to them? So they wouldn't be tempted. So they wouldn't invite them in and be tempted by their idolatry. That's 100% right. God knew who he was telling them to kill. He knew that those people would never come to know the, the Lord as their personal Savior, if you will, or never turn to God, never turn to the God of the Israelites. That, and that if they invited those women and children into their, the, into their country and make them part of who they were, that they were not going to leave their religions, that they were not going to leave who they were, that the women would still cling to that, and they would teach their children, and they would rot themselves from the inside out, and it's exactly what happened. God is that serious about idolatry. Flee from it. So when you kill off that nation, kill everybody, because there's none righteous, there's none that's going to turn to me. All they're going to do is ruin you. Because they're going to convince you of their idolatry. Or you're going to find one of those ladies and go, Oh, you're so pretty. I want to make you my wife. And she's going to say, Well, this is what I believe. And you're going to say, Okay, I'll believe it with you then. <coughs> kind of sounds a lot like Adam and Eve, doesn't it? <laughs> That's what's happened through the course of time. Cling to the Lord. Don't cling to idolatry. Don't have anything to do with them. What does he say? Flee. And that's what I'm going to tell you to do today. Anything that you know is a sin, anything that you know that the Bible says to stay away from, to get away from, don't try to get as close to it as you can. Don't say in my Christian liberty I can just do it. Don't say I can handle it and other people can't. Flee from it. Go the other way. Get away from it. And maybe you can handle it. But why are you going to push the boundaries? You don't really know until you get there, right? And then if you get there and can't handle it, guess what? You disqualify yourself. You sin. You cause all kinds of... Because there's always punishment for sin, isn't there? And there's always something to be paid later on for that sin. Just don't do it. Don't even get close to it. Flee. Let's have a word of prayer.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson. I know this is a hard concept that uh, most people would not even want to have anything to do with. In our, in our country and in our world today where we just want to do everything and don't worry about anybody else, we're so self-consumed and we just want to have our fun down here on this earth and not worry about eternal things and we just rub our shoulders with the world and we look like the world, we act like the world and then we wonder why uh, when it comes time to stand up for the truth there's no one around to do it. And it's because we've involved ourselves with so much sin that there's this great big huge gray area and we just don't even know what sin is anymore and we don't know what truth is anymore. I pray Lord that when we see and know what a sin is we'll just flee it. If the Bible says that, that it's the wrong thing to be doing, that we'll just get as far away from it as we can. Why even tempt ourselves? I pray, Lord, that we can look out and see that, that we can examine our lives, know what's right, what's wrong, that we can examine things through the truths written in the Word of God, and that we'll just fill ourselves with your Spirit and follow in your paths. Father, now we just ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, we do have a closing song. Apparently I didn't stop.